They are my sons, and in them shall dwell the hopes of a unified humanity. Their strength shall prevail not only when victory appears effortless, but also when it seems beyond reach, when doom settles like a shroud. In times of darkness, my noble sun shall shine the brightest. Throughout history, in every armed force, the relationship between soldiers and their commanders has always been one of the most crucial elements of warfare. From the respect for the leader inspired by personal strength and victories, to the behavior strictly regulated by the code of conduct. Discipline remains a vital component of service, without which any unit would simply become unmanageable. And even the finest defenders of humanity, the invincible warriors of the Astartes, submit to this most ancient rule. However, the Legion's relationship with their Primarchs has always been something more than mere subordination. The very nature of the Astartes sets them apart from the rest of humanity. To command the Death Angels into battle, it is not enough to be just a competent commander. For this, the Emperor created demigods, his genetic sons, each of whom by their mere existence can provoke acts of fanatical devotion among ordinary people, taking the very concept of submission to the level of instincts. Yet, this places immense responsibility on the Primarchs. They are infinitely removed from the sufferings of ordinary people, and even the Astartes under their command seem like children compared to these demigods. And the Primarchs had to exert tremendous efforts to achieve simple mutual understanding with their subordinates, and each of the twenty tackled this task in their own way. Moreover, each of the Primarchs had their flagship, whose appearance in a planet's orbit meant that its inhabitants were left with only one choice, compliance or flame. Primarch Lion L. Johnson of the First Legion always stood apart from his brothers in what could be termed as majesty. Anyone who beheld the Primarch in person noted that his very presence compelled one to kneel before him. However, the fact that every individual automatically perceived him as some divine figure sent unto them weighed heavily on the Primarch himself. Lion grew up on the feudal world of Caliban, where people were forced to fight for survival against creatures spawned by the endless forests and warped by the Immaterium. Throughout his life, he dedicated himself to protecting humanity from the horrors of the warp. And from his earliest years as a member of a knightly order, he absorbed the ideals of valor and martial brotherhood. This is why he transformed his legion into a semblance of knights. He saw himself not as a father and master, but rather as an equal to his legionnaires, a brother and commander and his overwhelming aura of majesty helped maintain the loyalty of his subordinates, even after 10,000 years, when the Primarch returned to his warriors. All of them, even those deemed fallen, those who had betrayed him during the times of Horus's heresy, returned to his banner without hesitation. Primarch Fulgrim is the living proof of the Emperor's genius, the impeccable leader of the Third Legion, a godlike, sinless entity, incapable of defeat or flaw, the most worthy of emulation and reverence, the embodiment of perfection. Yet, a blind fool, fallen victim to his own arrogance, a half-mad narcissist craving praise and adoration, a spoiled child enamoured with his own reflection, oblivious to the fact that he is made of evil and blood, a disgusting example of betrayal, unable to accept his own guilt. From birth, Fulgrim was the object of universal attention and admiration, a star child bringing water. He led his native world to prosperity, and when the Great Crusade found the Primarch, he was already distinctly aware that he was far superior and better than any of those around him. His ambition to perfect everything from warfare to art, he instilled in his legion. As Fulgrim sought to approach the greatness of the Emperor, his space marines aspired to be worthy of their Primarch. Fulgrim regarded the Legionnaires as his children and students, whom he ought to guide on the proper path, and was free to punish for their transgressions. The Emperor's children answered to him with boundless loyalty and genuine admiration, seeing their Primarch as the saviour of the Legion and the living embodiment of humanity's dream. Eventually, there was hardly anyone left who could see how the Legion and the Primarch were swiftly marching into the abyss, marvelling at the perfection of its void. Perfection turned into painful perfectionism. Mentorship transformed into arrogance, rivalry into enmity, an unbreakable fighting spirit into blind overconfidence. A legion that celebrated victory before battle became a legion of chaos-reclaimed cutthroats, becoming a nightmare for those they were meant to protect. 
The chosen warriors of Slanesh no longer strive for perfection. They have long achieved it in their pursuit of endless ecstasy and slaughter. Yet, even becoming carriers of terror, they retained this endless loyalty to their Primarch, time and again attempting to revive the long-dead Legion, and they were even ready to follow a clone of Fulgrim when their true Primarch withdrew from his children. Only Fabius Bile, who was always more of a scholar than a warrior, could afford to treat the grim situation with disdain. His pursuit of perfection was never of interest to the Apothecary. Perturabo, the Primarch of the Fourth Legion, was always demanding and reclusive. Few could earn his respect, let alone his friendship. He was the embodiment of iron, both in resilience and in insensitivity. He never shared the romanticism of his brothers, even the Great Crusade itself he regarded as a task to be accomplished. In this, he never relied on such aspects as loyalty and respect from his subordinates. Almost everyone who had seen the Primarch in the flesh described him as reserved and reticent, his mistrust for those around him bordering on paranoia. Perhaps this was why his personal guard never consisted of living beings, but rather a detachment of machines constructed by the Primarch himself, unfailingly executing any command. He demanded the same from his legionnaires. Every Space Marine had to be capable of completing any task assigned to them. The Iron Warriors were to become components of the immaculately tuned mechanism that the Primarch envisioned his legion to be. And if any part suddenly ceased to function, it was mercilessly replaced with a new one. The Iron Warriors themselves aspired to be worthy components of the Legion. However, their eagerness to please their Primarch soon crossed the bounds of the permissible. Peturabo failed to turn his Space Marines into unquestioning automatons, and each of them, in their strive to secure a distinguished place within the Legion, did not shy away from anything, not even the murder of their own brothers. Nevertheless, Perturabo found this state of affairs to his liking. After all, the Iron Warriors remain one of the few traitor legions that still exist as a legion to this day. Jagatai Khan, Primarch of the White Scars Legion, has always been an enigma to those around him. Beneath the guise of a savage nomad always lurked the cold and penetrating mind of a strategist and lord. Not given to verbosity and constantly concealing his intentions until the last moment, always making others regard him with suspicion. This blend of savagery and intellect made the White Scars stand out even among their brother Astartes from other legions. After all, Jagatai himself was a nomad and built his legion on principles familiar to him. He was always the chieftain of the United Tribes of Free People, not the general of a strictly organized army. The Primarch genuinely loved his legionnaires and encouraged among them freedom of thought and a creative approach to problem-solving, often leaving his subordinates to make important decisions on their own. Such an approach bore its fruits. The White Scars saw in their Primarch a strong and authoritative leader, but not a master and overlord. Because of this, at the start of the heresy, half of the Legion nearly turned to Horus's side. And it was only the Primarch's personal intervention that stopped the Legion from internal conflict. As for Lehman Russ, the father of the Space Wolves never aspired to be a lord and master to anyone. Raised in the culture of the wild peoples of Fenris, Lemon Russ, characterized by a very straightforward nature, simply took what he regarded as his and was always ready to serve those who proved to be stronger and more worthy than himself. Thus, he became one of the most loyal servants of the Emperor, seeing in him not a universally beloved master of humanity, but a leader worthy of allegiance against whom resistance was simply futile, his Space Wolves always operated on a similar principle. Recruiting from Fenris, Lehman Russ filled his legion with people who shared and supported his mindset. The Space Wolves were always loyal to their father and were willing to follow him anywhere. However, the Primarch never distanced himself from his sons, sharing with them the joys of victory and the madness of battle. He did not tolerate insolence, yet he understood humor. He was stronger than any of his legionnaires, but never oppressed them. He was always their leader, and they were his wolves. The relationship between Rogel Dawn and the Imperial Fists could be described as that of a father to his sons. The Primarch genuinely cared for his legion, turning it into an indestructible force capable of repelling any threat from space. 
He was always demanding and fair to his legionnaires, but did not tolerate betrayal or disobedience. The story of Sigismund exemplifies the relationship between the Primarch and his legion. When the captain of the First Company strayed from imperial truths, accepting the Emperor as a god, Dawn could not forgive his son, yet allowed him to fulfil his duty to the very death at the hands of Abaddon. While the histories of other Primarchs often tell tales of greatness and loyalty, Conrad Kurz represents more the embodiment of madness, disillusionment and contempt. Entangled and driven mad by constant visions of the future, the Primarch of the Night Lords despised his legion, comprised of men he loathed. In the end, Kurz simply let go and submissively awaited his death, which marked the end of the Primarch's endless nightmares. The Night Lords fully embraced their nature. If elite assassins are endowed with the power of the Astartes, they inevitably become the nightmare of all living things in the galaxy. And even the strength of a Primarch can hardly restrain the madness the Legion will unleash upon countless worlds, especially the power of a broken and insane Primarch. Sanguinius could have become a second Fulgrim had he allowed his flawlessness to overshadow his mind to the same extent as his brother. Fortunately for the Imperium, this did not happen. The Primarch of the Blood Angels was always the embodiment of devotion, humility and greatness. He demanded perfection from his children, but never distanced himself from them. He enjoyed the trust of the Emperor, but always sought to justify it. He gave his life in an effort to preserve his father's dream in a battle where he stood no chance of victory, and his legion always reciprocated their Primarch's feelings. Ferris Manus's approach to legion command was similar to Perturabo's. However, contrary to the Primarch of the Iron Warriors, he did not have such issues with trusting his sons. The Primarch was demanding but fair, cruel but not withdrawn and his legion endeavoured in every way to earn Ferris's respect and trust. But unlike the Iron Warriors, the Tenth Legionnaires had chances of success that were non-zero, something that could never be said about the World Eaters. In a way, the Twelfth Legion never truly found their Primarch. Angren was a man deprived of everything. The slavers of Nuseria took his freedom, the Butcher's Nails took his sanity, and the Emperor deprived him of his only friends in life and of death itself. Angron openly scorned his marines and initially killed anyone who tried to speak to him. Eventually, he accepted command of the Legion, but continued to despise it, constantly demanding the impossible. He purged the Legion of Psychers. From his personal guard, he demanded the strength of a Primarch and did not hesitate to kill his sons when they failed his commands. Ultimately, Angron followed Horus in the hope of avenging himself against the Emperor and became a maddened monster craving endless slaughter. The World Eaters, in turn, can be termed a lost legion. They aspired to earn their father's love and become like him. Eventually, the legion simply ceased to exist, dissolving into disparate bands of berserkers collecting skulls for the Blood God. As for Roboot Gilliman and the Ultramarines, there is not much to linger on. The 13th Legion was always the embodiment of order and civilization. Gilliman always regarded his space marines as his soldiers and subordinates. He treated them as individuals with whom one could speak, seek advice and even jest. However, the latter often irked those around him, as nothing in the Primarch's demeanour betrayed a sense of humour. In turn, the marines saw him as a commander, to whom they bore responsibility and to whom they must justify the trust placed in them to a warp disgracing neither the Legion nor the Primarch. The relationship between Mortarian and the Death Guard was always somewhat distant and cold. Fundamentally, everyone in the Legion simply did their duty, trying not to meddle in each other's affairs. Those rare moments when he found himself alone with any of his sons could be described as awkward and tense. Nonetheless, despite this, the Primarch cared for his legion. In a critical moment, he even gave himself to chaos to save the lives of his sons. However, such detachment led to some legionnaires feeling no loyalty or affection towards their Primarch. A captain named Typhus openly scorned him, believing he had done far more in the service of Nurgle than his Primarch. Magnus, the Primarch of the Thousand Sons, always loved his legion sincerely and at one point refused the idea of reassembling it to stop the curse of flesh change. 
He sought to save his Astartes by any means, yet fell victim to his own pride. In his undoubted genius, he came to believe he knew better than others and never heeded the counsel of his sons. At a critical juncture, this led to direct insubordination when 1,000 sons clashed with the Space Wolves during the burning of Prospero. This eventually led to the infamous Rubric of Ahriman, following which the Legion ceased to exist in any recognizable form. Primarch Horus, the Emperor's favored son, a warrior unparalleled among the Primarchs, the embodiment of the dream for a united humanity, the guiding light of the Great Crusade, forever etched in the annals of the Imperium as the Arch-Betrayer. During the times of the Great Crusade, Horus was the epitome of perfection, combining all the best attributes of his brothers, de-warp of their flaws. An unconquerable warrior and a grand diplomat, he was the wrath of the Emperor incarnate, yet also the beacon of the Imperial truth. He was not merely the father and commander of his legion, he was its essence. Each legion had a circle of captains, those closest to the Primarchs, yet none of this bore any resemblance to the famed Murnival, which was not just a military council but a true circle of friends. The Lunar Wolves were ready not just to kill and die for their Primarch, they were willing to do anything for him, even that which would ultimately cast the Primarch into the Abyss. Many believe that the wound inflicted by the sword Anathemy was the starting point in Horus's fall. However, this is not entirely accurate. Contradictions in the relationship between the Legions and the Imperium had been accumulating for a long time. Sooner or later, this was bound to have some consequences. However, without the interference of the Dark Gods, it is unlikely that it would have escalated into an overt rebellion. The galaxy is vast enough to find occupations for the discontented Space Marines. Yet, even so, the wound from the anathemy merely served as a pretext for the true desecration of the Primarch. Horus was loyal to the Imperial Truths. In his right mind, he would never have heeded the whispers from the Immaterium. It took something that would prompt the Primarch to hear the voice from beyond. It was the lethal wound from the Accursed Blade, which would have inevitably killed the warrior. That became such a prompt. Naturally, the ritual was not the first remedy used to save the warrior. It was the desperation of the close captains, witnessing that no one could assist their Primarch, that pushed the loyal friends to conduct a ritual in which nobody truly believed. It was then that Horus ceased to be himself. The Primarch returning to his sons scarcely resembled his former self. Trust was replaced with paranoia, intellect with cunning, and loyalty with hatred. As he advanced towards terror, Horus sank deeper into the abyss of madness and swiftly lost the respect of his legionnaires. And after the fateful duel with the Emperor, the legion ceased to exist. A similar narrative unfolds concerning Lorgar. Before the Horus heresy, the Primarch of the Wordbearers was sincerely devoted to his legion and humanity. He took pride not in conquests, but in the flourishing worlds he newly forged. He saw in the Emperor a divine embodiment of humanity's will to live, a notion that displeased the Emperor himself who denied any divinity. The public humiliation of Lorgar and the annihilation of Monarchia became a turning point in the Primarch's fate, instantly losing everything he believed in. In his quest for the universal truth, he lost his love not only for his domain, but for all humanity. After the heresy, he withdrew from his legion, and for 10,000 years now he has been delving into the essence of chaos in complete solitude. In fact, he no longer commands his legion. The relationship between Korax and his raven guard could be characterized by the phrase restrained devotion. It might appear from the outside that the Primarch is utterly indifferent to the fate of his legionnaires, and the Marines themselves regard him merely as a commander. However, the slaughter at the drop site vividly revealed this to be false. The practical loss of his legion has forever imprinted itself upon the Primarch's psyche. And for 10,000 years he has sought vengeance against the traitors and hunts for Lorgar himself to obliterate him from the galaxy once and for all. Vulcan, an indomitable warrior. Whose strength in battle was tempered by profound wisdom, Vulcan was the lord and embodiment of the entire Salamander's Legion. He was considered the most humane Primarch, yet, true to his Primarch nature, in fury, 
he matched any of his brothers, despite being aware of the destruction and the power and responsibility that he and his legion bore. When the Emperor told him of the other Primarchs, Vulcan merely shook his head. He had no desire to be a conqueror or a subjugator, as his brothers were. In all his endeavours, Vulcan always sought to limit unnecessary and senseless destruction, seeing in it a path to ruination and the devastation of the soul. He compelled his legion to shift their approach to warfare, tempering the warrior's inclination for self-sacrifice with an understanding of its potential long-term consequences. Additionally, through iron discipline, relentless training, and superior equipment, the legionnaires mastered close-quarters combat and operations in Mortalis zones to perfection. Under Vulcan's leadership, the Salamanders became renowned as skilled artisans, creating magnificent weapons. He silently shouldered any hardships that fell to him or his sons, gaining wisdom from these trials to become an even better protector for the burgeoning Imperium. Vulcan purged haughtiness and uncontrollable rage from the Legion, replacing them with stoicism and absolute loyalty to humanity. From that moment on, the Salamanders were no longer spoken of as wrathful warriors who charged into battle at every turn, heedlessly sacrificing themselves. Vulcan's warriors were now known as reserved and skilled warriors, whose anger quietly simmered in their hearts. But if he indeed burst forth, stopping them was impossible, like a volcanic lava wave sweeping everything in its path. For three thousand years following the end of the Horus Heresy, Vulcan led his chapter. But then the Primarch vanished, leaving the Salamanders with the task of finding nine artifacts he had hidden across the galaxy. Thus, Vulcan sought to test his sons. Interesting, a merciful conqueror, a true marvel. As for Alpharius and Omegon, the very nature of their legion does not allow them to stand out openly among the other space marines. The Primarch always considered himself equal to his legionnaires and quelled any sprouts of attachment and dependence of the legion on its Primarch. Alpharius needed the 20th to act independently of his direct participation and for each space marine to be equal to his Primarch. After all, each of them is Alpharius. The relationship between the Primarchs and their legions was always greater than mere subordination between a commander and subordinates. Astartes are no ordinary men, and to lead them into battle it is not enough to be just a good commander. Each Space Marine is an autonomous, competent and monstrously effective combat unit. Such a weapon must be kept under the strictest control, and the one who leads the Astartes into battle must possess an unquestionable authority among them. However, even the most flawless leader can lead his warriors into the Abyss. It's a different matter when the Abyss is the goal of their campaign. When the driver does not battle the Abyss but is instead its very spawn. When your leader carries forth fire and slaughter, when your purpose is absolute devastation. When you are led by the master of the end time. 